information or disinformation, you mm -hmm. just uh, offend the person you are talking while you are uh, trying to make mm -hmm. some compliments. So how yeah. can we prevent this? Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to take the first question first, which I think is obvious. Uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's obvious that a very devout person can be a very fine scientist. And I know that there are many, many devout Christians who are fine scientists and many devout Muslims who are fine scientists. Um, the, uh, to expand on that just a little bit, okay. Um, I was in a conversation earlier today, someone was mentioning what are the, the three things I believe that, uh, that Al Ghazali said are necessary to be a Muslim. Right and remind me what they are. Uh, the faith in the God is one. God, the, the messenger, and the hereafter. Okay, none of those three would preclude the absolute rational investigation of nature in any way that I know of. I think even if you expanded those into the more typical creed, uh, Islamic statement of faith that contains six statements: the book, belief in the books and the prophets, uh, and the qara qara, the, the yom um even then, I don't think you find anything that would prevent you from being a good scientist. Uh, there may be, it may be that there are groups among Muslims who have particular beliefs that they regard as Islamic that would conflict with the kind of findings that a scientist might find. But it seems to me that the broad Islamic tradition doesn't, isn't a problem, nor is the Christian one in my view. Now, the second question, that's a very good one. Misunderstandings. You're trying to compliment somebody and you say, you know, and, and you say something, go, oh, I'm not complimented by that at all. <laughs> well, this is, often a, this is often a problem when we try to even positively represent someone else's religion because we may not understand it. Now, let me give you a typical example. Again, I don't want to be controversial about it. Just give you a typical example. If a Muslim says, but we always honor Jesus, Isa al-Masih, we, we say blessings be upon him. You know, he's a great prophet maybe the greatest and a unique prophet in a certain way, right? Because he didn't die. He'll come again at the end of time. And is that not a compliment to you Christians? Well, no, it's not a compliment because Christians believe that Jesus is God and a great prophet is not as good as being God, right? So it, it's a way, and Muslims are trying to say, well, we're very respectful towards Jesus. We are very respectful, you know? And Christians, yeah, but that's not good enough. Okay, so... What's intended as a compliment can be taken as not a compliment. And I think the best thing to say is something to me. Would, I hope this would not offend anybody would be to say, look, within what's possible in my religious faith, I give Jesus the highest possible place I can. Within what's possible for me. Okay. Now, the same thing can happen in reverse because Christians can try to say something positive about Muhammad that doesn't nearly come close enough to being who Muhammad really is for Muslims. Right? Oh, he was a prophet. Oh, geez, that's not good enough because Christians don't think that prophets are all that big, right? We're not so, we, we don't value prophets the way Muslims do. So, again, I think what a Christian would have to say is um, something like, actually, Timothy of Stesiphon, he was a bishop who was asked um, who Muhammad was uh, by a sultan, and he didn't want to get his head chopped off, but he didn't want to be unfaithful. You know, so he, he thought about it very carefully, and he said, Muhammad walked in the way of the prophets. Uh, the sultan accepted that because he knew that that's the most that Timothy could say from within his faith framework and with no intention to denigrate Muhammad at all. Right? So I think that's, that's a danger, and I think the only thing we can do is, is try to, to say, look, I have to speak from within my faith because it's no compliment for me to lie to you, right? It's no compliment for me to say the words you want to hear when you and I know I'm not speaking the truth. So the real compliment is I will say the best I can within my faith about your faith. I, I hope that would be enough. Are there other questions? Yeah. Um, do you think there's also a difference of interpreting the Holy Scriptures from the uh, Christian perspective and from the Muslim perspective? Where, um, how do you think like the Christians, in, uh, when they read the stories in the Bible, they would think, oh, I should accept it literally, or shall I accept some of it symbolically, or how do Muslims think about it? And also, yeah. we see that in the Muslim world, there's really the interpretation of Quran. You know, like, no, normal people can't do it, but really it should be a very, very big scholar. Mm -hmm. And so since we don't have those great scholars of the past anymore, so we know that since Ghazali, probably since the 11th century, the Muslims, they really didn't want to, to really hardly 
interpret the yeah. verse of Quran, what, what I mean is ishtihad, like yeah, yeah. The, so what do you think about this? Okay, well let me, well, the question of ijtihad is a very interesting one, and I, I want to, rem I'm just going to remind you of a little history, or at least history as I've experienced it in my own life. Okay. Um, the, the question of ijtihad versus taklid in the Muslim community has really only arisen as a question in the last 40 or 50 years. Maybe you could go back 120, 130 years to Alaf Ghani or one of these guys. But at least when I moved to Malaysia in 1985, if you wanted to instantly lose your job in the university, all you had to do was suggest that the gates of each jihad are open. <laughs> okay, that was 25 years ago. That wasn't acceptable. Now, if you want to lose your place in a Malaysian university, all you've got to do is go, well, oh, no each jihad, man, it's taklid all the way. They'd say, oh, you Wahhabi, you're out of here. <laughs> so the Muslim community has changed a great deal in its own willingness to re-engage the Quran in this process. And I don't think it's my business to get into what's right or wrong about that. I think what's very important to understand is that although we talk about the Quran as scripture, a holy book, we talk about the Bible as scripture, a holy book, they are in no way comparable. They are in no way comparable. Okay. Muslims believe that the Quran was, it, is, has existed eternally in heaven in exactly the form that it came to earth through Muhammad, right? It's literally the words of God. Okay, there is no variation. There's no there's no variation in Qurans at all. Um, and by the way, another fact about it is that it exists most truly right when it's spoken and remembered rather than in its written form, which is a merely mnemonic device. Okay, now Christians have never been under the illusion until the mid 19th century, a group called fundamentalists, but. For the vast majority of Christian history, Christians have never believed that the Bible was dictated word for word by God. <coughs> it's not that kind of book. Okay? It's always been a book which could be interpreted and was interpreted quite freely with multiple levels of meaning because it was merely a doorway into a kind of communion with God's Holy Spirit. Right? So, so it was never, in t I mean, really, it's only in the last century and a half that you've had a strong American fundamentalist movement that believed in the literal interpretation of the Bible. You really don't find that in Christian history. Um, and that's a peculiar part of American history. I won't go into that. But they're really not the same. And I think Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Cragg, uh, I don't know if any of you know his work. Um, uh, if you don't, I would recommend you read it, although it's dense and hard to read. But uh, Kenneth Cragg was an Anglican bishop and a scholar of Arabic and Quranic Arabic, um, and may have been, although he was a Christian and a bishop, one of the finest scholars of the Quran of the 20th century. Uh, hardly anybody knew it and the Islamic tradition better than he did, um, as you'll see if you read one of his books, assuming you can understand what he's saying. Um, but nonetheless, Kenneth Cragg pointed out that if you want to draw an equivalence, okay, it would be better to say that the Bible, the Christian Bible, more closely resembles the Hadith, the Sunnah of the Prophet. And that if you want an equivalence for the Quran, you would have to say for Christians it's Jesus Christ, who the Bible says is the Word of God. When Christians want to meet God in immediacy, we meet Jesus Christ, not the Bible. The Bible's a derivative instrument. Okay? Now, so that's that's the difference there. And if we understand that, then we can see why it doesn't do much good. You know, you get some kind of, you, sometimes you get sort of a Muslim polemic about the Bible having so many different versions and all of this stuff. Makes no difference to Christian theologians. Makes no difference whatever that there's so many, because we don't rely on it and we don't believe it has the same status as the Quran. We believe Jesus Christ has the same status as the Quran. So I think that's a useful, useful thing to think about. Um, and can help us out. In the same way, Christians need to understand, and I, as I sometimes remind my students, that it's really a little bit offensive to Muslims to interrogate the Quran with the same kind of scrutiny that we use for the scriptures. Right? Now imagine this. I mean, just think about this for a second, if I can. Take it a little further. 